everyone knows Tom. If you have not seen Tom numerous times on TV over the last year, you either do not own a TV or your TV is broken. Uh, Tom is a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Pulitzer Prize winner is met with the interviewed or involved with countless politicians and other well-known people, written countless articles for the New York Times, written numerous books, including thank, including thank you for being late, which includes a chapter on growing up in Minnesota, specifically St. Louis Park. My friend, please give a big class of 1971 welcome to Tom Friedman. So, I've been asked to ask Tom a few questions and he's been delightful and he's setting for spot. So Tom, what have you been up to in the last 50 years? <laughs> Well, thank you, Jay, and uh, thank you everybody for coming out. This is this is a treat. Uh, I'm not used to public speaking, but this is uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. Um, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, Jay, after I I, uh, I left St. Louis Park, I uh, I got a BA in Arabic and Middle East history, and then I got a graduate degree in Arabic and Middle East history from Oxford. I got hired by UPI in London on Fleet Street um, in 1978. Um, uh, as a starting reporter. The number two man in the Beirut Bureau of UPI got shot in the ear in 1979, and he said, get me out of here, I want to pass, don't want to pass go, don't want to collect $200, and they came to me and said, would you like to go to Beirut? Um, and I, I uh, hauled off to Beirut in the middle of the Lebanese Civil War, um, uh, lived there for four and a half years in the Civil War, got hired by the New York Times, uh, covered the whole Lebanese Civil War, the New York Times sent me to Jerusalem as their bureau chief, then uh, they gave me a year off to write my first book from there to Jerusalem. Then they made me the chief diplomatic correspondent and I traveled all 750,000 miles with Secretary of State James Baker, uh, watching the end of the Cold War, that was fun. Then they made me the chief White House correspondent and I covered Bill Clinton's presidency, which was Mr. Toad's wild ride. Um, and, uh, I ended up covering the White House, which is a combination of babysitting and stenography. Um, then I, for two years, I was the International Economics Correspondent, and in 1995, they made me the Foreign Affairs Columnist, and then I came here today for my reunion. So that's what, that's what I'm doing. So when did you decide to become a journalist? Uh, when did I decide to become a journalist? Well, the first story I ever got published um, uh, in the Echo uh, was when I was uh, in, in uh, Hattie Steinberg's journalism class, and I interviewed Bob Stein, who was a graduate of St. Louis Park High, who was a defensive lineman for the Gophers. And um, I never forgot it because I got to do two things. I got to sit in the press box for the game, and I got to go into the Gophers locker room and interview Bob Stein. And from that moment on, I knew that I wanted to be in the room where it happened. Um, and that was, uh, that was really when I, the bug, you know, And how, how did you actually get your start? Uh, I got my start, my actual start in journalism was I was in graduate school uh, in London, and um, I was uh, walking down the street with my then girlfriend, now wife, in 1975, and Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford for president. And we walked by an Evening <coughs> Standard uh, newsstand, and, and they always have these blaring headlines, you know, uh, Brad to Jen, we're finished, or whatever. And uh, this blurry headline said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. And I stopped my then girlfriend, now wife, and said, look at that, uh, this guy's running for president, he's trying to win Jewish votes by promising to fire the first ever Jewish Secretary of State, isn't that odd? And um, I have no idea, Jay, what possessed me, but I went back to my dorm room and I wrote a column about it. And my then girlfriend, now wife, happened to be the next door neighbor of the op-ed page editor of the Des Moines Register. And she took that column home on vacation. He liked it, they printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with an Alf cartoon, and they paid me $50. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I was walking down the street, I had an idea, I wrote it up, and someone paid me $50. And that's, uh, that's how I got started. I got hired by UPI. I was just telling uh, one of my favorite teachers, Mip Gagel, I'm working on a new book on how to write a column. And uh, I'm gonna share with you how the book opens because it's actually um, my first day of work at UPI in London, 1978. 
I was hired as a cub reporter at UPI on Fleet Street in July 1978. I was so nervous that I got a bloody nose my first day of work. I was so nervous I got a bloody nose my second day of work. I was so nervous I got a bloody nose my third day of work. I was so nervous that I got a bloody nose and it would not stop bleeding, so I had to spend a night at London's Charing Cross Hospital, be sedated, and have my nose cauterized. I was so nervous. All of this was much to the amusement of the grizzled UPI veterans in that London bureau. I had just graduated from St. Andrews College, Oxford, with an MPhil in Arabic and Middle East Studies. Most of my UPI colleagues had gone to various schools of hard knocks and come up as wire service street reporters. I was in awe of their ability to write a breaking news story on deadline on manual typewriters and early word processors, often, in some cases, with a bottle of whiskey hidden under their desk. They were not in awe of me. I was just this kid with an Oxford degree who was nose bleeding all over his keyboard on deadline. I spent almost a year in London as a general assignment reporter. My first byline news story for UPI was about the death by drug overdose of Keith Moon, the drummer for the rock band The Who. I had never so much as covered a fire or a city council meeting before then, so everything was a learning experience, which is why I always admired the story about Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. Walton rarely granted interviews, but legend has it that he did one for a daughter of a friend one day who was an aspiring journalist. She asked him, what is the key to your business success? Making good decisions, Mr. Walton answered. Well, what is the key to making good decisions, young woman asked. Experience, answered Mr. Walton. Well, how do you get experience, young woman asked. Making bad decisions. <laughs> so, yes, experience is what you get from not having it when you needed it, and I got a lot of experience that year. My first real story was a breaking news event that the UPI editors decided to send me out on. It was the takeover of the Iranian embassy in London. This was 1979. I was part of a small group of reporters that the students led into the building. This was before cell phones. So to file my story, I had to get in line at a London red phone booth with my notes and wait in line. The phone box was one of those classic red British telephone booths. There was a long line with other seasoned Fleet Street reporters who urgently wanted to dictate their stories to their editors. It was the only way to get the news out quickly. I patiently waited my turn for the phone. When it finally came, I got inside the booth. I excitedly flipped through my notebook, telling my editor on the other end, who was taking my dictation, everything I had seen and heard from inside the embassy. At one point, my editor asked me a detail about the embassy and those Iranian students, and I faithfully said to him, wait a minute, I'll check. So I opened the door of that little red phone booth and said to the Fleet Street reporter waiting in line behind me, do me a favor, would you hold the phone for me? <laughs> then I dashed out of the phone booth. Before I had taken two steps away, the reporter whom I had asked to hold the phone in the line behind me slipped into the booth, slammed down the receiver, disconnected my call, and started dialing his own newspaper. As I stood there in total shock, he turned to me and said two words that I would never forget. Sorry, mate. Yes. All you would-be journalists out there, this is definitely rule number one. Never, ever, ever ask your competition to hold the phone for you. <laughs> Tom, you've been at the New York Times. You've been at the New York Times for 41 years. What are some of the highlights? Well, you know, I, I have had uh, uh, some amazing experiences, but, you know, Ken's film uh, touched on it that um, the things you remember most are really people. Um, uh, and and the, the, you know, I've always said to young journalists, you want to be a journalist, they say, what do I need to know? I say, well, you need to know how to type fast and get good English and all of that. But the thing you really need most is you have to like people. Uh, because if you like people, they like you back, which they mean they open themselves up. And they tell you the crazy things that they, they, think, that they think and do and fear and hope for. And so I like people. It's actually amazing how many journalists hate people, but I actually like people. So um, that's what I remember most. Yeah, I remember the housewife in Beirut to, uh, who uh, turned to a guest at a dinner party and said, uh, would you like to eat now or wait for the ceasefire? Um, you don't kind of hear that in Sanders Park. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was growing up. I went, uh, I went with the US Navy on a, um, uh, they took me on their ice exercise beneath the Arctic on a submarine. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience um, uh, coming up under the sea, uh, crashing through the ice, you know, going back down. I uh, was on this sub for 28 hours, and um, uh, there was one Jewish sailor on the sub, and he asked me if I would stay for Passover, that they had a brisket in the freezer. And um, uh, 
I said, no, actually, um, I want to get off this thing as fast as I can. <laughs> uh, I remember, I, I remember, uh, I remember him. I, I, I remember interviewing Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin when he was Prime Minister and I was in his office and we were having, I'm interviewing him, asking him questions, and he had next to his desk the red phone. The red phone. Wow, the, the red phone. When that thing rings, you know it's trouble. And uh, in the middle of the interview, the red phone rang. And Rabin turned, he said, excuse me, Mr. Friedman. He picked up the phone, waited about 30 seconds and said, wrong number. <laughs> so, but, uh, never, never forget that one. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was, I was traveling with James Baker and we were in the Kremlin um, uh, the week the Soviet Union ended. Um, they, would, they would do this thing when, um, when the Secretary of State would visit in St. Catherine's Hall, there'd be a very stylized thing, very ornate doors here, ornate doors there, the doors would open, Baker would come out one door, and Gorbachev would come out the other. And this time we're in there, the press is in the middle, you know, waiting to talk and ask questions, and uh, the two doors opened, Baker walked out, and out walked Boris Yeltsin. Wow. And um, I remember we were in the Kremlin all day, and this was December, and we got out, um, it was snowing, and one of the most beautiful sights in the world is actually to see the Kremlin covered in snow. And um, I looked up at the flag, they have a spotlight on the hammer and sickle flag, and thought that may be the last time I will see that. And uh, a week later, the Soviet Union was gone. So that was, that was a memory. Um, I got to interview the President of China once, and I got to ask him a question I always wanted to ask him, which is, what's it like to, to, to rule 1.4 billion people? Um, and he uh, said it was scary. Um, I guess maybe one of the, I'll end with this one. Um, uh, when the Iran nuclear deal, which is being revived, actually got signed um, uh, back in 2015, um, the White House called and said, um, uh, it woke me up at three in the morning and said, um, the, they just finished the Iran nuclear deal and President Obama wants to give you the interview, be at the White House at 11 o'clock. Now normally that would be just a great thing and I'd be excited, but I had just broken my shoulder um, uh, on a hike. And um, I was on OxyContin. And, um, but I was not going to miss this, so I got my daughter Natalie, who is the executive producer of All Things Considered, weekend on NPR, to carry my suitcase, and we went to the White House, and uh, sat with the president, it was, on, it was on video, the whole thing, in the Oval Office, doing the interview, and, um, and after it was done, you know, the cameras broke down, and there's a little hallway between the Oval Office and outside, and he stopped in, the, in that hallway and said, Friedman? you need to support me on this deal. And I was so fucking high on OxyContin. I, th I thought there were three of them. <laughs> and they were all pointing their finger at me. <laughs> so uh, that is certainly one of my, one of my oldest memories. Uh, so those are a few. <laughs> probably most important, how did growing up in St. Louis Park influence your life? Well, um, let's get to this. Sorry, hold on one second. So uh, it had a huge influence on me. Um, uh, and probably got me in a lot of trouble because um, growing up here it gave me an optimism bias. Because um, I grew up in a time and a place and in a real community. And um, I saw pluralism and tolerance. I saw good government. Uh, I saw people uh, compromising uh, for the greater good. And so um, my column actually was called the Foreign Affairs Column for the New York Times, but it actually could have been called Always Looking for Minnesota. Um, because I basically went up in, uh, to the world and, and um, judged places by, to what extent they were like St. Louis Park, where I grew up in. And so I actually saw, because I went from here to Beirut in the middle of the Civil War, I saw a country break down. I actually saw what happens when community dissolves, when people don't compromise. And there's always a tension in my reporting, Jay, between those two things. But um, I was in Israel once having dinner with the uh, editor of Haaretz, which is a, the sort of best paper in Israel, and they actually run my column from the New York Times. And I asked them, why, why do you guys run my column? And it's a big treat for me, but why do you run my column? He said, Tom, you're the only optimist we have. And, um, <laughs> Uh, there was a general at the dinner, General Zidane, and he said, I know why you're an optimist, Tom. I said, why? He said, it's because you're short. 
He said, you can only see the part of the glass that's half full. And so, and so, uh, so uh, uh, I told him, you know, I, I'm, I'm not that short, but I, that is true. I, I try to always see the glass as it's half full. So um, obviously MJ Life, I shared with you, some of you may have read it, some not, because this is actually um, how my last book ends, because you know, the last chapter is all about St. Louis Um So uh, whenever I think about my high school years, when I first discovered journalism, the Echo and the Mandela, and the friendships that were formed then, I always think back to the closing line in the musical Jersey Boys. Frankie Valli is looking back on his amazing singing career, and he says the following. They ask you, what was the high point? The Hall of Fame, selling all those records, pulling Sherry out of a hat. It was all great, but four guys under a street lamp, when it was all still ahead of us, the first time we made that sound, our sound, and everything dropped away, and all there was was the music. That was the best. That's why I'm still out there singing, like that bunny on TV with the battery. I just keep going and going, chasing the music, trying to get home. Which is why I ended my book this way. On a research trip back home in the summer of 2015, I drove by our old house in St. Louis Park at 6831 West 23rd Street, where my parents had first moved from North Minneapolis in 1956. I hadn't done it for years, but decided on the spur of the moment to swing by the old house. At one level, the old neighborhood, the tightly packed Rambler homes, looked remarkably the same as when I left mine for college and for work in the 1970s. Ours was still painted a light blue. But something also struck me as different. I couldn't put my finger on it at first. My old neighborhood was totally familiar, but slightly unfamiliar. It took me a while to figure it out, and then it finally dawned on me. It was the trees. They were all small and scrawny when I was small and scrawny. <laughs> Ours was a spanking new neighborhood when I grew up there. And now, a half a century later, all the trees had all grown tall and thick with long branches, and they were full of leaves, so much so that the neighborhood was considerably more shaded. The light had changed slightly. Sorry. And it had caught my eye because it contrasted with that much brighter mental image I had been carrying around for so long in my mind's eye like an old picture stuck in the back of my wall. Those trees and I had both grown up out of the same topsoil. And the most important lesson of all from the journey that is this book is that the more the world demands that we all branch out and the more the biggest forces on the planet keep accelerating, the more we each need to be anchored in, contributing to and enriching the topsoil of trust that is the foundation of all healthy communities. That prescription is easier to write than to fill. But it is the order of our day, the real uber task of our generation. It's so much easier to venture far, not just distance-wise, but also in terms of willingness to experiment, take risks, to reach out to the other, when you know that, there's, that you're still tethered to a place called home and to a real community. Minnesota and St. Louis Park together were that place for me. They were my anchor and my sail. I hope this book will inspire you to pause and strive and find yours. Thank you very much.